Hello, everyone, and welcome to those of you who were here last night. Welcome back. Um, this is the Catamaran Writing Conference Virtual Reading and Lecture Series. I'm Matt Simmons, and I'm the conference manager for the online series this year. We weren't able to have our conference, which is taking place at the beautiful Stevenson campus on 17 Mile Drive, which has been a seven year tradition for us due to the pandemic. But next year we will have one and we look forward to seeing you all there. The new dates are July 25th to the 29th, 2021. But that's a long time for all of us to wait before we get connected with all the poets and writers who have gravitated around Catamaran. So this week we have several talks and readings lined up and you can register for all of them here on Crowdcast with Catamaran Literary Reader. Last night we had Jane Smiley talk. Uh, later this evening we'll have Joe Millar and Susan Brown. On Tuesday we're gonna focus on fiction with Karen Joy Fowler, Josip Novakovic, Lisa Fugard. And on Wednesday we're gonna turn to nonfiction with Neil Snydow, Joan Staffen, Charles Hood, and Dan White. And we hope you'll join us for some of those events um, on, here on Crowdcast as well. But right now we have Zach Gao. He is the author and editor and translator of 20 books or plays. His ninth book of poems, Irreverent Litanies, was published by Regal House Publishing. He is also writing a series of plays about authors. The most recent of these, Colette Uncensored, had its first stage reading at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. and ran in London, San Francisco, and Portland. His blog, Advice for Writers, has more than 200 posts on topics of interest to writers, and he serves as the contributing editor to Catamaran, judging the Catamaran Poetry Prize for the last three years. Now, before we get started, a couple things to know about Crowdcast. Uh, down at the bottom, there is an ask a question little button. So if you go there, you'll be prompted to ask a question or suggest a topic. This is gonna be really useful for this talk. This, there's going to be a lot of engagement and back and forth. We'll read out as many questions as we can as we go. So just feel free to put them there, suggest topics, do whatever. At some point we will also have polls up. So there's a polls section too. And when I tell you about a poll we're going to put up, you can check there and fill in your answer. Um, right now, this is going to come up in a couple minutes. I want you all to, in the chat box, put your favorite first line of a poem. And we're going to talk about those pretty soon and read about them. But right now, we're going to turn to titles, poem titles, book titles, the title of this talk, and just talk about how titles are crafted and how we go about them. So Zach, why don't you tell us about your most recent title? OK, thank you. Is. Thank you, Matt. Um, and I, I just wanted, to, oh, there are a couple of people I think who are saying that they can't um, hear or see. Is there anything we can do to help them connect? Uh, maybe the best I can think is try refreshing your page because I don't think it's um, on our end since there are a lot who mm. can. But I'm not, that would be my suggestion. So if any anyone is having trouble with uh, the connection, try refreshing and hopefully that works. It also, Crowdcast seems to work better in Chrome than anything else. So also try to view it in Chrome. And I know that can be irritating if that's not what you use. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. And I'm very pleased to be here. I wanna start by thanking Catamaran Art Center, Literary Arts Center for the amazing work that they've done over the last seven years to um, to revitalize the and bring together the arts community both on the west coast and in the wider network of catamaran that, that extends um, even beyond north america and uh, catamaran has played such a, a key role in, in the literary community in the time that it's been around and i'm very pleased to be here under their invitation so I'm going to talk about a, a lot of aspects of poetry today. It's, it's going to be um, an opportunity also to ask questions, as Matt said. And um, I, I'm, I was going to start with the beginning to talk about titles. And oftentimes titles are kind of a throwaway. We don't really think that much about the title. It's just kind of the doorway into the poem. But it can be a very inviting portal as well if we pick a title that has um, that invites the reader in. And I think of a title kind of as the wrapping on the present. 
And you can you can give someone a great present that doesn't have any wrapping or that's wrapped in yesterday's newspaper, and that's fine. And the, you know, it will still be a great present. But if it's beautifully wrapped with a you know wonderful bow that you made, that um, that is even more inviting. So um, you know, I was, I was looking at a book um, by the wonderful writer uh, Hannah Block, who um, uh, died a couple of years ago. She was a Bay Area writer, and and Hannah was very good at titles. Um, I love her title of one of her books, The Past is Changing. And I was just looking through this book of hers and picking out the titles that I thought were really good and why they they want, they made me want to read the poem. Um, one of her titles, for example, is The Messiah of Harvard Square. So, you know, that's like a mystery in, in, in five words there. You know, who is, what, what does that mean? You know, I just want to know more. Um, she has another title, Song Without Words, which might be a reference to some music. Sometimes titles that refer to other things can also invite people who know those references. Um, she has a title, The Discipline of Marriage. We don't usually think of marriage as being a discipline, so putting those two words together is very exciting. She has a title, Wild Honey. Anything with the word wild in it, you know, I immediately want to read that. Um, so, you know, how, how active are the words that you're using in your title? Um, she has a, a book, a, a, a poem that's just called Blue, one word. But that, that says so much, so you want to know more. Um, so that gives you an idea. Oh, another, and then another one is called um, Living With Myself. So, you know, just, just sometimes the title can do a lot of work. And the kind of work that a title can do is sometimes to to give the reader a better clue about what the poem is about. You know, for example, in my writers group recently, someone someone brought in a poem that we all really liked, and we liked every line of the poem, but no one knew what the poem was about, and there was so, everyone was a little bit hungry for that extra flavor. And you know, sometimes a title can can be the um, just the key that will unlock a poem for the reader. And it doesn't have to give away too much. It doesn't have to tell the reader everything about the poem, but it could just hint at what, um, what, what, the, you, what, what prompted you to write the poem, for example. So, so it's a bit of like a gateway or a staging, right? In yes. your view? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, allow the title, you know, there are great poems that have you know, kind of boring titles, like, um, uh, well, let me think. I, I was just reading the poem Sympathy by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, which is such a fabulous poem. Um, Maya Angelou got the title of her book, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, from the last line of that poem. And um, so the word sympathy is, you know, it's it's a strong word, but it's it's not a grabs you by the by the heart, you know, title. Um, but the first line is enough to um, to get you, you know, I I know what the cage bird feels, alas, you know. And um, so let's let's talk about first lines. We'll move on to first lines. Yeah, we can move on to first. But actually, before we do, what about the title of your irreverent litanies? How did that come about? Is there something so, there that? Th this is my most recent book, Irreverent Litanies, which was um, published by Regal House and uh, last year. And if you and, click the uh, link, you can buy it at the and bottom. Thank you. <laughs> and um, a litany is, of course, uh, a, a type of poem that repeats um, the uh, the first few words in every line. And um, usually it's it's a kind of prayer or, or a spiritual poem. And, uh, but I wanted to put the word irreverent in front of it to show that um, for me, spiritual traditions always have to be um, examined or looked at with, with, a, with a, a bit of a squint in the eye, you know, because I'm, I'm not a person who takes things on faith easily. I grew up in a household that was uh, militantly atheist. So um, as, I've, as I've gotten more interested in spiritual traditions, partly through my son, who uh, was bar mitzvahed a couple of years ago and got very involved in the process of preparing for his bar mitzvah, not as a formality, but really as a spiritual discipline. 
um, this book kind of evolved out of that tension between my upbringing in, a, in an atheist home and my um, kind of trying to come to grips with whether spirituality had some kind of call and place in my world. So um, I'm curious what people have put into um, uh, yeah. into the chat window in terms of favorite first lines. I see a couple here. We have do not go gentle into the good night, that good night. Oh, what a great line. Yes, of course. And um, another reason why I don't keep a gun in the house. Um, I think that's a title, right? By Billy Collins. Billy Collins has some very um, wonderful first great lines time. in his uh, poems. Um, none of I the... was thinking, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, there's one Lisa put none of the pain was sharp. Oh, was... yeah. I mean, you want to know more, right? When you hear something yeah, like that. Yeah, a lot of these, yeah. Um, I mean, one, one of the classic first lines is, April is the cruelest month. Uh, of course. T.S. Eliot started the wasteland. And um, there, there's those few words because April is supposed to be the tenderest, the softest, the most hopeful month. So for April to be the cruelest month, you, you know, you, you can't avoid re reading more with that, mm -hmm. uh, with that first line. Um, and when I say first line, I'm not necessarily meaning exactly, you know, the words that are from the first left margin to the to the end of that. It could be, you know, something that goes a little bit farther, like the W.H. Auden's uh, opening of um, Musée des Beaux-Arts, which goes um, about suffering. They were never wrong, the old masters. And um, uh, I, I love how he does the syntax in this line. <laughs> about suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. Yeah. So the way we would sometimes say that if, if we were writing an essay would be, the old masters were never wrong about suffering, which actually isn't a very interesting line, but somehow just by breaking up the syntax um, and making it not ordinary, um, he's made us think about it and think about the music of that line and it brings us into this kind of artistic um, window that he's providing um, in the poem. Um, another another first line, Emily Dickinson is, is amazing at first lines. She didn't use titles, Emily Dickinson. I don't think any of her poems are titled that I can think of. Um, but she did use first lines very effectively. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of, I'm nobody, who are you? You know, you're immediately yeah. asking the reader a question and, and saying something very surprising um, that makes you want to uh, continue. Another, another poem of hers that has a wonderful be beginning is, I taste a liquor and never brew. Um, you know, if you have a paradox in the title or the first line, um, that's something that, that gets people um, interested in, in what you're going to say next. I think, yeah, I think a lot of those really draw you in and set that stage for what the poem is about to do. There's a, a bunch more that are now referenced in chat, too. We have oh, let's see. all of the new thinking is about loss in uh, this. It resembles Robert all has, the old thinking. Yes, yeah. meditation at Lockley Names. That, that's such a wonderful poem. Um, uh, when it is not yet day. To what purpose, April, do you return again? Uh, the sea is calm tonight. That's Stover Beach, I think. Oh, uh, um, yes. And that deep... has a killer last line, too. Oh, that has an amazing <laughs> last paragraph. <laughs> Go... Yeah. Uh, as deep as I ever went into the forest, Mary yeah. Oliver. It's a good one. Mm -hmm. That is no country for old men, the young. That's Yeats, right? Yeah. Um, who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Is that also Mary Oliver? Um, but they all make you question, wonder um, about something that isn't like wonder about what is missing. It's the same like you were saying about a title, right? It sets up or the title maybe frames it and gives you some information, whereas the first line seems to make you want to know what comes next. Mm -hmm. So how do you find a first line like that? I mean, one of the things that you can do is um, sometimes the title or and or the first line come at the end of um, your, your process as a writer. <clears throat> Sometimes you have to 
write the whole poem before you see what the title or the first line is. And maybe I'll read a poem from my book and give you an example. I think that'd be great. Yeah, I think an example of uh, the poem and maybe then how you got to the first line would be wonderful now. Uh, so this poem is called Credo, which is um, actually a Latin phrase that means I believe. I believe that gravity is a temporary condition. I believe that all forms of blue cheese are sacred. Why else would they call it gorgonzola? I believe that dental assistants get so moralistic about flossing because their work brings them terribly close to God. I believe there are such people as spiritual healers and they are overpaid. I believe in a radical democratic equality where your cousin is entitled to listen to Neil Diamond. I believe that anyone who contributes to the extinction of the species should spend 10 years in the jungle surviving on gathered plants. I believe the designated hitter is an abomination. I believe that there are alternate realities where Paul Clay would be considered a photorealist. I believe that all nations and ethnic groups have a right to self-determination in order to make their own disastrous mistakes. I believe in a universal treaty of human population reduction that every country will participate in proportionately. Easy enough to negotiate, right? I believe that women were put on earth to satisfy men and other women, and that men were put on earth to satisfy women and other men. Yes, I believe that the universe does not necessarily have a purpose, but if it does, it might be hazelnut gelato. I believe that five days a year, people should be allowed to come into work late just because they stayed up till dawn. I believe that paying for memberships in gyms and pools creates a mysterious barrier to exercise. I believe that those who obey every rule should hike to the North Pole in stiletto heels. I believe that love is the most perfect thing and therefore not practical for humans. Wait, I don't believe the second part. I believe that music is the most supreme speech and that speech is the most supreme music. I believe all languages are spattered full of moonstones, jaspers, star rubies, and jade. I believe that poems should end before their readers start to think about their next meal, and I believe in the power of beauty to redeem all things, especially broken snowmobiles, highway entrance ramps, and airport bathroom sinks that sense your hands praying for the water to flow. So when I, when I wrote this poem, it's kind of a list poem. You know, it's, it's, it's a litany where, where you repeat a certain phrase. So in a sense, the parts are interchangeable. And so when I first wrote it, that, that opening line, I believe that gravity is a temporary condition was maybe like set down in the poem. And even when I finished writing all of the lines, it was still there. And then someone in my writing group said, you know, you know, that first line about the blue cheese, eh, you know, it's okay, but I don't think it's the first line because it's not, it, it doesn't, it doesn't um, provoke enough. And um, so someone suggested that the, the line about gravity is a temporary condition was, was sort of more fruitful as a first line because it doesn't explain anything. It questions that answers. And that's good in a poem in a way, because it, 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 it allows the reader to get engaged. Um, definitely. I think it definitely draws in. And I think one question we had too that that poem I think really gets to is the question about litany and the repetition of a phrase at the end or the person asked at the end of a line. But I think here we really have that, I believe the credo repeated and yeah, I think that really helps to just like frame where the rest of the poem is going. Yeah, the title is Credo. Um, someone asked to see it, and I can try and show them um, if they want to see how it's set up. Mm -hmm. um, since I have this copy here. Um, this is the poem, Credo. And Maybe make it a little larger if that's possible. Uh, oh, is that better? Okay. There we yes. go. So this is how it's structured, as everyone can see. And so it has this, I believe, at the beginning of every line. And that's and maybe show them the end, too, because we're going to talk yeah. about endings and closure. And, and you see how it changes at the end? It doesn't 
start necessarily with I believe. And um, so we'll, we'll talk about that more when we talk about endings of poems. Yeah. And so that is, um, and I'll do this with the other poems too, so everyone can see there's a few that the layout I think is especially important. Um, so I'll do that maybe while you're reading. Um, in the future, I'll share the poem on the screen. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think the the repetition of the litany, what like is the draw to that for you? Is there particularly uh, like a particular element of litany that you were trying to get at with this poem, or is it? Well, I, I like how how the how the list poem can be both a kind of prayer and a series of one liners. You know, I'm very influenced by. <laughs> Uh, stand-up comedy in a way. I think there's a, a, a connection between poetry and stand-up comedy. You know, it's one person up there in front of an audience with only a microphone and the words that they have. And uh, and, and I, I see a lot of poetry in stand-up comedy. Uh, and I, I think I think there's, there's a way in which um, uh, that, that kind of repetition that can build towards something is um, uh, is is a good structure. You know, it's I mean, it's always a puzzle to me, like what kind of structure makes for a good poem? Because um, there's so few words in a poem. How do you create a structure in that few words that makes the reader feel as though they've had an entire experience? That it's not just yeah. a slice that they didn't get enough of the whole. But it, but they feel like they've had the whole experience in just that that page or page and a half or even a few words. Yeah, and I think the the like mantra element to it, the I believe, I believe, I believe, but then the changing allows it. I mean, this poem is comedic at many points, right? We have the Neil Diamond, and we have many other instances, and so it has that comedy element. But the mantra almost feels like it's luring you to like uh like feel comfortable with those laughs to like make you feel comfortable and then throw the laugh at you by just repeating this i believe so maybe we should kind of segue into talking about middles yeah let's do that um because um uh what you just said matt kind of raises the question of well what do you do once you've set up a pattern or you've set up a story or you've set up um a kind of uh uh, tension or um, form, or there's so many ways that you can set a structure in a poem. Uh, what do you do in the middle of the poem? So, um, as I said, if you've, if you've set up something like this, you've got your machine moving here, your, your word machine moving, um, the middle of the poem keeps doing what it is you've, you've started, uh, whether it's telling a story, whether it's fragmenting things, whether it's um, uh, creating a particular moment in time that had a, that had a certain uh, res deep resonance for you, um, whether you're recalling something from your family history, um, you're developing in the middle. You know, the middle has to be a kind of flowering and unfolding of what you start at the beginning of the poem. And um, uh, uh, you know, to go back to the metaphor of sculpture, <clears throat> um, you were asking Matt about you know the title sculpture in the poem. So I was thinking less of the sort of classic metaphor of sculpture, which is, you know, there's this block of marble and the, the statue is in there and you've got to get at it. <laughs> so that's a great metaphor. I love it. I think it even goes back to Aristotle. And, um, uh, but that isn't what I was thinking of. What I, what I was thinking of was more those kind of funky clay sculptures that we made when we were little kids that we brought home to our parents and they said, oh, that's very nice. You know? <laughs> and, um, uh, but, but when we were working on those funky clay sculptures, you remember the teacher always said to us, make sure you wrap it in a paper towel and put a plastic bag over it because you don't want it to get so hard and fixed and dry that you can't work on it again tomorrow at tomorrow's art class. And so that's what I want encourage people to, to, to think about in terms of sculpting their poem, like keep it wet, you know, keep the words wet, don't let them dry on the, on your, in your mind as you're composing, like it's, every part can be moved, you know, there's, there's nothing fixed until, until you published it in a book, and even then, 
even then you might want to improve it. And so, um, so keep your mind open. Like don't don't get so stuck on one particular wording or um, order or uh, sequence or phrase that you that you can't change it. There always has to be that liquidity about um, uh, a, a liquid quality to 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 the words to keep them alive and to allow the 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 process of editing to to continue because that's part of the creative process. It's a, it's an essential yeah. part of the creative process. Well, and I like that too because it it moves away from the idea that there's a perfect poem sitting there waiting. And if you can just chisel exactly right, you will get there. And instead, it's about the process of creating that poem and going back to it and working on it more and molding. So how does that lead to the middles of poems? What is that messy middle process of both writing the poem and editing it and, mm -hmm. you know, reading? Well, the there was there was a famous incident that occurred um, in 1968 when there was a general strike in France yeah. and everything shut down. Not because because of the pandemic, but because the country is sort of re-examining its whole economic structure and political structure. And um, so everything shut down, including the Cannes Film Festival, the famous Cannes Film Festival, which was, you know, the premier film yeah. festival in the world. So instead of having the festival, all the people who usually take part in it um, got together and debated politically, you know, what is the correct... Um, way to approach art from a political standpoint, which I think a lot of people are asking today in this yeah. very urgent year that we're in. And um, so there was a famous discussion between Jean-Luc Godard, the French director, and Jean Renoir, who was the older generation of, of French directors, um, you know, who had a more traditional narrative kind of style. And Jean, Jean Renoir got very frustrated with, you know, all these new ideas that Godard was throwing out. And he said, well, you, you agree, don't you, that a film has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And Godard said, yes, but not necessarily in that order. So, um, you know, that, that always, I always think about that phrase because a poem has to have a beginning, middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. And sometimes, um, just like in that phrase of Auden's where the syntax gets all mixed up, um, sometimes the storytelling can get all mixed up and the beginning becomes the best because it's somehow, um, uh, it, it somehow uh, shines a much brighter light on the, on the, on the material that you're, you're writing about. Interesting. So then do you, you've mentioned how sometimes when you're writing, you recognize the beginning only once you get to the end of the poem and then you mix it. How do you work through that process i guess it goes to the one of the questions we have which is how do you keep something pliable how do you keep a poem pliable how do you not get caught into that strict well this was the end that i wrote so mm. it's the end of the poem well i, th I think it is a meditative process in the sense that you you have to, I, I love the i love the concept of the muse the traditional greek concept of the muse the muses by the way were goddesses and um the, the, the idea was that you were a vehicle for, um, for, the, for the poem. And um, every vehicle is different. Each one of us has a very, very different individual kind of vehicle for poetry. And yet there is something that we are channeling that is bigger than us. So you have to kind of get out of the way of the poem at a certain point. And um, you have to allow that channeling process to happen. It was very interesting. I don't know if people were able to attend Jane Smiley's wonderful craft talk last night, but she talked about how she wrote her book, The Greenlanders, that had just kind of poured through her. And she said, I didn't want that to happen again. And I was thinking, no, Jane, no, that's the good stuff. That's the stuff the poets like, you know, is, is yeah. when we have that moment where we feel like we're, um, we're not in control, you know, that, that, that we, we are allowing something bigger than ourselves to emerge in our, in, our, in our poems. I think that's actually, so like that idea, right, of the poet as conduit goes back to the Greeks and it's still in like inspired, which is like possessed by spirit. And I think it's interesting because I, of the poets I know, they are more wanting that experience where maybe with fiction writers, it's a bit more pushed off you know, so what is it about a poem that 
like how does reshaping tie in with that being possessed by spirit if you is that when you feel it's done maybe this leads into the question about ends but how how do you get to that point where you feel like you can actually be done with the poem after being inspired is that what you wait for well you, you still need the moment of reflection afterwards where you're okay. where you're reading it cold you know where, where you're you know because sometimes you know the day after that inspiration looks kind of weird so you, you've got to you've got to get the distance from it um and and that's also where, where your literary community comes in you know you have to you have to show work to people you, whose taste you respect and whose work you like and um and listen very carefully. When I go to my writing group, I literally write down every single comment that every person says. And then I look at them again later, maybe weeks, maybe months later, um, when I have a little bit more distance and I'm able to um, to not be so attached to, uh, to my own writing. Um, so you were talking about endings and maybe we should start yeah, talking yeah, about that okay. so that um, we, can, um, we can then take questions. And... Um, so closure in poetry, like people use the word closure a lot. For a long time, I heard the word closure and I just couldn't understand what they meant. Does that mean like your hand's getting caught in the door? Like what is closure, you know? And, um, you know, I, I, I read a lot of poetry endings and, and I feel like there are three different kinds of, of closure that people use in poetry. And uh, one of my favorites is what I would call the resonant image. So sometimes a poem ends with... Um, with, with just an image, not with, um, not with a conclusion, not with a summation of any kind, but just an image that kind of leads you like a chord at the end of a beautiful jazz ballad. It just resonates all the way through the, the poem. And uh, you know who's really good at this is Joseph Millar, who's going to be reading be in about sure. an hour and a half here. Um, so listen for that in his work if you stay tuned for that reading. Um, Joseph is just one of the masters at, um, at leaving the reader with that resonant image that doesn't tie everything up into a neat bow. It, it kind of, but it does leave you very satisfied in the sense that you feel that kind of, um, vibration between the last line and the rest of the poem. So uh, and another great example of that is um, John Keats's poem. I think John Keats kind of invented this way of ending a poem in his famous sonnet um, on first looking into Chapman's Homer, which by the way is also a great title, I think, in a kind of yeah, weird form. Um, and he has this image of Cortez and his men looking out over the Pacific Ocean. And um, and, and he, the poem has nothing to do with the Pacific Ocean or Cortez. It's all about reading this new translation of Homer that suddenly made him appreciate um, the Odyssey. And, and yet he goes to this image that's not part of the poem, but resonates so deeply with this whole idea of discovery and awe and finding something that just opens up this vast vista for you, you know? So yeah. that's one way, the resonant image. Well, and I think I, in the chat, in, in the chat, we have the beside the white chickens line so much, mm -hmm. time, which again yes. is another type I would say. Yeah. So Dick we have <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Um So uh, another another kind of clue poetry is repetition. So I was talking about that poem of, of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, uh, Sympathy. And he starts out with the line, um, I know what the caged bird feels, alas. And he ends with the line that Maya Angelou borrowed, I know why the caged bird sings. So, um, you know, you have repetition, but the second time you hear it, it's slightly different. And also you've had the whole poem to kind of deepen your whole sense of what it's like for that bird to live in this damn cage. And so when you hear an ending on the word sings, it's just, it's overwhelming. It's just an incredible poem. And um, so repetition, another person who's a master of repetition and endings is uh, Federico Garcia Lorca, the Spanish poet. So if you want to see a fantastic example of that, look at his poem, uh, Sleepwalking Ballad or Somnambul Ballad, it's in English, because he starts out with this amazing refrain, uh, verde que te quiero verde, and, um, and then a couple of lines after that. And then 
he repeats it at the end of the poem, almost like at the end of a ballad, you repeat the refrain. And um, so repetition is, is also a very powerful way of ending a poem. And the, the third way that I'll just kind of mention is the killer last line. And um, the killer last line is, it's not, it's not tying everything up. It's not um, uh, a neat package. It's, it's kind of a new revelation that you somehow got to as a result of what you went through in writing the poem. And, you know, one of the, one of the great killer last line writers is Sharon Olds. If you, if you want to see some great examples of killer last lines, Sharon Olds is just amazing at that. And, she, you know, for example, in her poem, uh, I go back to May 1937, where she talks about her parents meeting. And she's going back to this moment where her parents first met. And she's saying, no, no, don't do this. Don't do this. Because so much pain is going to result from your marriage, from your children, from all of this. And then um, I wish I could quote a few word for word. But she says, at the end, she says, um, no, no, I changed my mind. Do meet each other. Let this happen. And I will write about it. And uh, God, amazing poem. And um, uh last line and but again not a summary don't try to summarize don't try to tie it up but allow it to um, open up a whole new vista in a way it's like a resonant image in the sense that it, that, that it opens up something much wider at the end of the poem. do what you are going to do and i will write about it oh thank and you and i will tell about thank it you. sorry thank you so much for and interesting she doesn't say write about it yeah, she says tell, which is interesting. But so with last lines, why don't do you have a poem that you think particularly has great closure that you would like to read for us? Um, I don't know about great closure. But, um, <laughs> Not to put the pressure. But, oh, the, the other the other thing about closure is that it's changing something. That something in the poem changes at, with the closure, whether it's you hear something that's been repeated that you hear differently the, the second time. So I'm, I'm going to read the last poem in, in my book, which is uh, Dayenu. Okay, and, let me uh, pull that up. Dayenu is um, a Hebrew word that means it would have been enough. And it's, um, it's a song, it's a refrain from a song in the Passover Seder. So um, in the song Dayenu, it's, it's, it's saying it would have, you know, because the Passover Seder tells the story of the, the Jews um, uh, escaping from slavery in Egypt. It would have been enough if uh, God had just allowed the Jews to escape. It would have been enough if God had parted the Red Seas. It would have been enough if manna had fallen from heaven. Um, and I try to apply this to cosmology. So that's, that's what this poem is doing. So again, Dayenu means it would have been enough. If there had been only stars with their stitches of light and no planets, that would have been enough. If there had been only lifeless planets with strands of quartz and gold, Diana. If there had been just the breathing oceans vaulting against boulders, only microorganisms with their endless division and multiplication. If there had been only forests of coral, merely the minnows, their tiny hearts licking against glass bodies, if there had been only the firefish, the butterfly fish, and seahorses disguised as kelp. Only the desert and its runnels of sand, just green beards of grass and no redwoods. If there had been only black onyx, no lemon serpentine, no azurite. Only the insects with their x-ray wings and flashing songs. Just the geometry of snakeskins, no mammals. Only gray mice, their hearts valving 600 times a minute. If there had been nothing but a hummingbird pinning itself in midair. Only the elephant with its vault of bones. Only the zebra so unaware of its own beauty. Only monkeys chattering their no language. That would have been enough. Only the first humans weighing their young in their arms. Diana. Only that and not the peacock domes of Isfahan, not the mood indigo of Ella's Ellington album, or the white stone garden of Rio Anji Temple, where no viewer can view every dark rock, no broken torso of Apollo, or acts of love beyond number. Would it really have been enough? 
So uh, again, where the closure comes in is that it changes at the end. It's asking a question and say, in, instead of saying, yes, it would have been enough, it would have been enough, it would have been enough, but would it really have been enough? <laughs> I mean, don't we really need all of it, you know? And, and in a sense, kind of cosmically, don't we need all of it? I mean, somehow the fullness of the universe is necessary. I don't Definitely. know if that makes any sense. No, I, I, think it's, I think it's beautiful. That poem really stuck with me when I read it too, because as you are reading it, you are thinking, yes, each of these beautiful parts of existence is enough to like make it worthwhile. And then at the end, when you get to the, you know, not not these acts of love, not all everything we have. It really does flip the entire poem around on itself. So yeah, I think that's that's a great example there. Um, so okay, let's let's open it up to questions. Yeah, see. let's try and get um, some people asking questions in the chat. Have you two learned what beauty is for and have you changed your life? Interesting. It's that one from um there was also a poll we were going to ask because I think we had one of the questions I had wanted to ask and you touched on it a bit was how poetry can respond in times like these, right? With pandemic with mm -hmm. civil rights movement and so on. So I think we had wanted to ask a poll and maybe we can do that while we also wait for some questions. Yes. About... Uh, I, I see four things under ask a question here. Um... Yeah. So we have, three of those we've gone through. The new one, I guess, if we want to do that, is the second half was human made things, right? Yes. And yeah, so that's the second half of that poem there. Yeah, I, I mean, the reason I switched to human made things is that I was starting with the, with this, the simplest and the smallest things and, and kind of, um, well, stars are not small, but this, let's say the most elemental things and trying to work up through history the history of cosmology in a way to the present day almost that yeah that works really well i we have two new questions already coming in so we have okay. um can you tell when a poem is an imposter oh that's a good question <laughs> which an i think is great yeah. um well in a sense all poems are imposters they're all creative things you know poying the verb that the word poem comes from means a creation so it's not a real, it's not the reality. It's a, it's a creation based on reality. Um, but when, when is it an imposter when it's not um, felt from the heart, maybe when it's not felt from real lived experience, not even necessarily your own experience, but someone's experience. And uh, when you, when you don't feel like you have a stake in it, you have to have a stake in your own work and you have to, feel like you're risking something in writing it. So if, if you haven't risked anything, then that could be the imposter poem. Good question. Yeah, I think that's a great question, great answer. Um, we also have Lisa Bennett is asking, how did you uh, originally get poetry published and was that difficult? So maybe, yeah, what was your process on yeah. poetry writing? Well, I would say that I started sending out my work too early in a way. You know, when I was writing in my 20s, I was so excited about what I was doing. I'm still very excited about writing, but um, I just wanted to immediately send my work out to all the magazines where that I was reading that I really loved. And uh, I think I did it too soon because some of the editors saw my, you know, juvenilia and, and, and said, oh, this guy is not really very good, which was true. And, um, and they formed an opinion of me, so I wouldn't be in too big a hurry to publish i would wait until you really feel like you have a body of work that you feel are the best work i wouldn't say you need to spend decades doing that but i would you know make sure that you've shown your work to people whose whose judgment you respect deeply and um and that you've considered their opinions about your, your work and, and incorporated them into into your writing where it seems uh, appropriate um I think a lot of poetry is personal contacts. You know, go to readings, meet other writers, meet editors. The AWP conference, if if God help us, it ever happens again, you know, um, uh, is a great place. There's a book fair there where you can go around and see all the magazines and meet all the editors. 
Um, that's a fabulous way to get a sense of who's looking for work when. Um, I make little notes to myself when I find a magazine that I really like. You know, oftentimes they say, we're closed for submissions now, you know. But I then look and see, well, oh, September 1st, they're going to be open for submissions. So I put a little note on my phone and I say, you know, submit to blah, 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 you know, September 1st. And then I remind myself to do that so that um, I know. Another good way to start is with uh, themed issues and anthologies. Because um, when someone is doing a themed issue of a magazine or an anthology around a theme, they're not necessarily looking for famous writers. They're looking for writers who have something that relates to that theme. So it's a good place to start because if, if something resonates with you, Jen, oh, I have a poem that's about that theme, you know, then send them that even if it's just one poem. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. It reminds me a bit of John Cheever's comment that like the growth of a writer isn't nearly as interesting as the growth of like a painter where you can see them learning where with the writer you just see the juvenilia as your word was which yeah is a great word um we have a couple more questions too what about experimental poetry where poems don't have a beginning middle end i'm thinking of lynn hedginia for example mm -hmm. i'm not familiar with the person so i'm sorry if the name was incorrect lynn hedginia yes um so um, I, I think William Carlos Williams was the one who, who once said, all great poetry is experimental poetry. So I, I think that um, there are all different kinds of experiments. I don't believe in experimentation for the sake of experimentation. I think experimentation has to, you have to need to make something in a particular structure um, because, of, because the emotion or the ideas of the poem push you to do that. They want to be in that structure. So, um, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of good can come from collage and mixing things up and taking things up and putting them together in different ways, as long as there's some meaning and there's some emotion at the end of it. If it's just an experiment to, you know, we're going to throw all the words up in the air and see where they land. That can be a good beginning, it can be a good practice, it can be something that stimulates you to write something that you didn't know you wanted to write. But if that's the whole thing, that you know, just throw the words up in the air, see where they land, that doesn't interest me very much. We also have another question, I guess, about beginnings in a way. So any su examples or suggestions on starting a poem or using a title as a way to start backwards? Oh no. Just move to the top in the middle of it. Hang on. To <laughs> start backwards and pull a poem inside out uh, to speak without losing the impact of those last lines. So if you have like an end or a title you really like. So I, I, I like the idea of pulling a poem. That's a fabulous um, I'm not sure I totally understand. Can you repeat it again though? Yeah. So the question says, any examples or suggestions on starting a poem or using a title as a way to start backwards and pull a poem inside out, so to speak, without losing the impact of those last lines? And maybe, mm -hmm. yeah, does that? Um, I wonder if the person suggesting yeah. that somehow the first line could, could be a kind of prompt almost for the poem. And sometimes people will use the line of another poet as a first line, as a, and then write something completely different from the poem that that poem, poet um, had, had originally produced uh, with that line. And that can be a, a great prompt. I think that's a great idea for a poem. But make sure that you're really writing something very different from what the person was writing where you took the, po the line from. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what the person was suggesting, but I, I love that phrase to pull a poem inside out. I think that that's a very, um, uh, thought-provoking and, and useful idea. That's great. Oh, there's a couple more questions on um, what you've learned not to do, for instance, and I think you partially touched on what interests you in poems and not, and two questions back, but yeah, what have you learned not to do with your poems and with your contact with publishers? So kind of... Okay. Um, not to do, um, not sum it all up, not try to sum everything up, not try to, don't try to tie up all the loose ends. Um, uh, 
let's see. Um, yeah, not to try to send out things that I haven't vetted in terms of you know showing the work to people who, whose opinions I admire. You know, because when you write something, you're so hot on it. You know, you're so excited about it. Yes, but let it sit for a while. You know, Jane Smiley talked about how she she'll she'll put away her manuscripts for months before she'll look at what she's written. Uh, I think that idea. Um, uh, I think you have to read calls for submission very clearly when you submit to publishers. You're going to waste their time and your time and money if you don't read the call for submissions very, very clearly. And um, because editors will tell you in a call for what they're really looking for. And I always try to um, uh, to read sample poems from a magazine before I send to them because you can tell from you know reading five poems. Um, oh my God, this has nothing to do with my work. This is this isn't the mag. This is a fine magazine, but it's nowhere that's ever going to publish my work. I think that's really good, and I think um, I guess a parallel question is a uh, suggestion for places to get help in improving poems without the cost of an editor if local groups are few? Hmm. Well, what about creating some kind of online writing group um, like this, you know, where people can, can get um, more feedback from, from other writers um, who are not necessarily local? Um, um, you have to read a lot. I mean, I think, you know, one of, one of the most important inspirations uh, for, for, for writers is to read, a, learn something from every writer, even the writers that you don't like, especially the writers you don't like. You can sometimes learn. I, I once heard the poet Kim Adonisio say that she, she learns the most from a poet who, who she likes, but they kind of got one thing really wrong. And that tells her who she is as a writer, because... Um, that thing that they got wrong is something that she really, well, it's wrong to her. It wasn't wrong to the other poet, but that thing is something that she really values in, her, in, in a writer and in her own work. And so, yeah, learn from your reading. You can get so much from, from reading other writers. I think that's a really good solution. I think as we were talking about too, online is just such a great resource right now. Um, people really like the, especially writers you don't like. Okay, let me see. Another question just came in. I like this one. Yeah. What is the relationship between Zach the writer and Zach the editor? <laughs> this is a good... um, I learn a lot from editing. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, when, when you edit, um, you have a chance to, to widen your perspective about what's possible because you're seeing what other people are doing. And sometimes that can prompt something in your own creative process, not necessarily the same thing. Um, so yeah, I think editing is very useful. I think, I think it's also a kind of um, a repaying a debt to the literary community. So many writers have influenced me and, and have supported me in my work that um, editing and publishing people's work is, is part of the the churning of the literary community that's very to to keep things going like that as an update on the poll if you're interested zach we have eight people who said they have written a poem about coronavirus covid 19 and seven who said they haven't so there mm -hmm. seems to be a a lot of people right thinking about this moment too in that way which is really interesting to see have you written poems about the present <laughs> COVID moment. You know, I, I wrote a poem right at the beginning, when, during the very strict part of the, the shutdown, because things were so radically different, so suddenly, that it really struck me that I had to write something. Since then, I, I haven't been able to write about it. It can take, it can take a long time for an experience to sink in and be digested to the point where you can really write about it. I, I once heard the writer Sandra Cisneros say that, um, it takes 10 years to be able to write about an experience that you've had because you've got to process it. I don't know if every experience requires 10 years, but but don't beat up on you can't write about the latest issue because there'll be another issue. Um, or it may take you a long time to be able to understand what it is that you're feeling. 
now. Uh, but keep writing notes, you know, keep taking notes so that you have something to work from when you're ready to write about this time. At, on that, actually, one question I had about your your book was the, I think, multiple poems you have referenced your hitchhiking in the Sahara. And one of them is specifically about that, and it's brought up in another one of your poems. And I'm just wondering if there's a link between that event and litanies or that event and spirituality for you. Or if there's mm -hmm. something that ties in there, why now is that central to this yeah. book? Um, well, when, when I was 18 years old, I got this crazy hitchhike through the Sahara Desert in the summer. And uh, I, I ran into a French anthropology student uh, in Spain who had the same idea. And we, 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 we literally did hitchhike into the Sahara Desert in July. And um, uh, it was a very formative time for both of us. She became um, a, a leading anthropologist in France on the Arab world. It was like a, a life-changing poem for her. And um, for me, it, it strangely enough made me think about my Jewishness because um, I was very much in rebellion against, you know, my culture and heritage in, the, in, that, in that period of my life. And seeing Semitic culture through Arab culture um, made me realize a lot of similarities between that culture and Judaism that were different from just being an American. You know, there, there, were, there was a kind of affection between uh, fathers and sons that I see in Jewish culture that I saw in Arab culture. And, um, uh, well, a lot of things. But, um, uh, so yes, that was a kind of formative moment for me too, that, that, hitchhiking through North Africa. Awesome. Speaking of closures, so is there a poem you would like to end with to maybe show us uh, an example of surprise, show us an example of what is, what else is in the book that spoke to you at the time? Okay. Um, I'm going to read a short poem. Uh, this is a sonnet. Um, uh, a number of the poems in, in the book are about, um, I'm talking about Irreverent Litany, which is my newest book, and um, uh, a number of the poems are about ecological themes. And to me, the, the poet who first really kind of uh, brought ecology um, to English language poetry was William Wordsworth. And uh, Wordsworth loved the Petrarchan sonnet, and so I wrote a Petrarchan sonnet about Wordsworth. Wait, um, um, really quick, which one is it so I can show it? It's called, If Wordsworth Were Alive Today, it's on page 13. Okay. Oh, can it be a little bigger? It's hard to read. Okay. If Wordsworth were alive today. Wordsworth, if you were here alive today, in cities of dittoed apartment blocks, identical as soldiers' grave white rocks, what would you think of us? What could you say of glaciers turned to ghosts, herons robed in oil, and gyre tides of polyethylene that leatherbacks mistake for jelly's sheen? I wonder if you'd fly from all this spoil. Or would you dive into the present mode, denounce Dean Cole, fracked veins, the dollar trap, take a day job as an art custodian, and maybe teach yourself software to code a write-your-own-romantic poem app while nights you learn to cook Cambodian. I think that's great. I think especially that last line is another one of those great examples of flipping. It's wonderful. Um, okay, so I want to thank you again for the thank talk you, and for the reading and for talking with everyone. I want to remind everyone you can buy signed copies of Zach's latest book, or Reverend Litany's, with the button down at the bottom, buy his book. And in an hour, we will have Joe Millar and Susan Brown here to do a reading and to Two do questions fantastic as well. Poets, by the way. Really yeah. nice thoughts. Don't miss so that. come back for that. Definitely. All right. Thank you again. And thank you everyone for showing up. And Zach, thank you for being uh -huh. here as well.
Bye, everyone.